Hi, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on predicting and responding to coral bleaching in the Western Indian Ocean. This webinar is co-sponsored by the Reef Resilience Network and Cordio East Africa. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Elizabeth Shaver. I'm the science lead for the Reef Resilience Network, and I will be your host for today's webinar. This will be our first of two webinars this year that will focus on coral bleaching tools, predictions, and manager resources. This webinar will focus exclusively on the Western Indian Ocean, and another webinar later this year will focus on another reef region, which we'll announce soon at, at a later date. But today we are really privileged to have three speakers who will share with us about bleaching predictions and alert tools specific to the Western Indian Ocean and how managers apply this data to monitoring response protocols and communications. So we'll first hear from James Mbugwa from Cordio East Africa, Dr. Marie Smith from the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, and then Dadley uh, Ziganyu from the Kenya Wildlife Service. Next slide, please. Before we begin, I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be one hour and 15 minutes long. It is being recorded and the recording will be posted on our website. We will also send it via email announcement after the webinar. So please feel free to share that and watch it again later. There will also be a question and answer period at the end of the presentations. And there are two ways for you to ask questions during that Q&A session. The first is that you can use the question box anytime throughout the webinar to send us questions and we'll keep track of those for the end of the presentation. The other option is that you can raise your hand during the question and answer session and I will call on you to ask your question during that time. You raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon on the toolbar that's next to your name. So please feel free to do that. We love to have um, a lot of webinar participation during these events. If you're having any technical difficulties, like trouble hearing or seeing the slides, please let us know by typing a message in the question box and we'll try to help you resolve that issue. So we'd like to start the webinar by getting just a sense of who is in the audience with us today. Um, we're gonna do this through just two quick poll questions. The first is that we'd like to know what region you work in. So is it the Western Indian Ocean, the Caribbean or Atlantic, the Pacific Ocean in the Northern Hemisphere, Pacific Ocean in the Southern Hemisphere or other? I'll keep this open for just a few more minutes or a few more seconds. Looks like a lot of people are voting. All right, it looks like most of the participants today are Western Indian Ocean. That's awesome. Um, very good uh, turnout for this webinar about this topic. And then we have a, a number of people too from the Caribbean and Atlantic, uh, some from the Southern Hemisphere and the Pacific, and some in other locations or maybe multiple locations. All right, our second poll question for you um, will be a little bit about your work. Yeah, we can just put that up there. So please let us know about the, the primary role that you feel um, is, is your, your work. Um, are you a marine resource manager, scientist, researcher, student, or other? All right, results are in and it looks like um, so 41%, most of our respondents are, are scientists or researchers, um, followed by marine resource managers, uh, almost 30%, 9% um, are students, and then 20, about a quarter of us are in the other category. So maybe community members or um, conservation or restoration practitioners or another role there. So thank you so much um, for letting us know a little bit about you. And we are going to move into the presentations now. Our first presenter is James Mbugwa, who's a GIS and remote sensing specialist and a project manager at Cordio East Africa. He's involved in the spatial analysis and interpretation of earth observation data to address various environmental challenges facing local communities in, in the Western Indian Ocean. Over to you, James. 
Uh, so thank you, Liz, and uh, welcome everyone. And thank you for um, taking part in today's uh, webinar. So as you've heard, uh, I'm James Mbogwa. Uh, I work for Cordio East Africa, and we are located in Mombasa, but operating in the Western Indian Ocean region. So Cordia is an, uh, a, a marine research institute, an NGO, and we specialize in corals, and that is in line with what I'll be uh, presenting today. That's on predicting and responding to coral bleaching in the Western Indian Ocean. Next slide, please. Next, yeah, so yeah, here's the outline of what we'll be looking at. So we have three main uh, thematic areas. So that will be highlighting and some other sub themes that we'll be looking at. So we have, uh, we'll be looking into uh, uh, taking a snapshot on the coral reefs and climate change, and also diving into tools and then pre the prediction for the 2022 season. Next slide, please. Yeah, so just as uh, short as uh, kind of um, quick synopsis of the status of the coral reefs of the world. So in 2017, Cordio participated in the GCRMN reporting uh, mechanism or reporting, and we contributed to the this report of the status of the coral reefs of the Western Indian or, or of coral reefs of the world. So this report, next slide. Uh, it basically uh, highlighted, uh, emphasized on the, uh, actually kind of emphasized on the fact that the coral bleaching are the greatest disturbance to the wild coral reefs. Uh, and looking at from 1998, again, you can see that th there has been a loss of the, of around 8% of the wild corals due to bleaching. So in short, there is a, a very direct relationship between increasing temperature and hard coral cover. And next slide, uh, putting this into perspective. So this is just an illustration of the of the relationship that is there. So on the graph on the right, you can see that there is a very clear relationship with the uh, temperature changes, the SST anomalies uh, that is showing in the with the black uh, line and the uh, on the uh, right uh, right hand axis. And then we have the hard coral cover in blue that is showing the a decline with every increase or deviation with SST anomalies over the years. So looking at this, the, 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 you can draw a um, uh, an inference in that you can see that there is increase in frequency. So the red bars, as you can see, those are showing the the, the magnitude of uh, coral bleaching uh, episodes since uh, in 1985, around 89 there. And you can see that the magnitude and the frequency of bleaching is is becoming more frequent now, looking at the last 10 uh, yes, for instance, from 2010, the red bars shows the, the the timing of coral bleaching event, and then the the, the width of the bar shows the the magnitude. So what this means is that looking at the temperature deviation, there is a decrease in in coral cover, and then the frequent uh, the frequency that is there, you, it means that corals are having very little time to recover once there is. Uh, a bleaching event. So next slide. Yeah, so putting this into perspective, so basically you see that there is a, a decline in coral cover over the years, and then there is a sharp increase in algae over the years. And this significantly shows that the most likely it's a kind of a phase shift and some form of succession taking place that is quite worrying. So who, th this is quite worrying and looking at the projected uh, SSTs in the, over the years. So will the coral reefs experience further declines in the coming decades? So this is a question that everyone is worried about and it's time that we should maybe come in and uh, start to try our best to see how we can save this ecosystem. So at Cordio, we have developed, next slide, um, uh, a coral bleaching uh, forecasting for the Western Indian Ocean just to try and 
counter or have ma reef managers to to deal with these uh, events or to be able to to respond to the coral bleaching uh, events and threats. So the coral bleaching uh, focus that Cordial runs is actually um, uh, an early warning system that is designed to forewarn managers and scientists about coral bleaching threats and help them to plan uh, and respond appropriately. So the uh, system and all the alerts they run from January up to June based on the on the severity of bleaching or how hot the air is predicted at that particular moment. So the so the, the, yeah, so the coral bleaching uh, system itself draws data from multiple resources to, co to focus uh, coral bleaching. First of all, we look at the global indicators, like getting some information on projection from the UK Meteorological Center. Next slide. We also dive into and look at the regional and interannual variability indicators, looking at the El Nino Southern Oscillation Index and also the Indian Ocean Dipole and also the monsoon patterns per se. Next slide. We also uh, look at the present state of clouds, cyclone, and other multiple sources from multiple sources, including NOAA and uh, European Space Agency at some point. And then through expert knowledge, next slide. Yeah, so this is interpreted and the alert is compiled and sent out to the Western Indian Ocean Reef managers with the indication of the, uh, yeah, of the condition of the, uh, of the state of the ocean for the next coming uh, like two weeks. So the alert system or the coral bleaching alert itself is sent out through uh, twice a month, and we do this repetitively over the, the, the our summer season that I mentioned. It is from January to around June. In forecast for 2022, and uh, looking at the Decado projection, they indicate that 2022 is uh, relatively cool uh, after peaks in 2016 and 2019, and this is information that we've drawn from the UK Meteorological Centre. So at the moment, we have an active La Nina that will last us throughout the to the end of July, the end of the bleaching season in our region. And meanwhile, also the Indian Ocean Dipo, what we call the IOD, is neutral. And then we also have very active tropical cyclone uh, in the in the Western Indian Ocean region. I think we already have four so far. So putting all this together, next slide. We predict that the we predict that we forecast very low uh, levels of bleaching for the wheel of this season. So yeah, so the region, even if you look at the uh, uh, at the ensemble member prediction on the right, you can see that the the season will will be experiencing quite a cool season with uh, very little bleaching uh, forecasted for 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 the next around for, for the next four months per se. So, but how how will the situation look like in the coming years moving forward? So at the, looking at the global indicators, we find that the 2023 uh, will focus in uh, kind of somehow initiate a, a new cycle of, of record hot years. You can see the shading with the blue and the pointed arrow there. So, and it is a high time that we should take some action looking into this. So we might be experiencing a, a cool season, but things are, going to change in the coming years. So what are the actions that we need to, 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 to take or what do we need to do at the moment? So first of all, there is uh, an urgent need for continued monitoring and reporting of reefs condition at different sites. This is basically essential so that we can be able to compare how things changes in the, in the future. Likewise, there is also a critical need for reducing local pressures on coral reefs in order to maintain their resilience. And this might entail review of existing policies and enforcement mechanisms just to enhance local mitigation measures. 
And uh, most importantly, also there is a need for new technologies and tools so that to ensure that we have the, the capacity to survey large areas of our, our reef sites. So we are glad maybe we'll hear more about the Arn and Coral Atlas that might be a, a reprieve on a, a useful tool when it comes to uh, these uh, large scale surveys. So to help um, the resource managers maybe to, 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 to undertake some of these uh, actions. So we've had at Cordial, we've developed some tools and uh, resources that will help uh, uh, the WIO managers or anybody who is involved in reef monitoring and conservation to respond to this. So you'll see this on my next slide. Yes, next slide, please. Yeah. So, yeah. So on this page, we pulled, sorry, just go back one step. Yeah, so based on the projections that we've just talked about and the need for quick action, so we've just pulled together a few, uh, some of the tools that we have at Cordio that will help the the participant or the stakeholders to respond when or even to have a, a timely and a rapid co uh, information on uh, instance of coral bleaching. So on the far left, we have a coral monitoring guide that is available in English and French and it is downloadable. So we have compiled this list and forwarded it to the organizer. So you'll get this information at the end of this uh, a webinar. So again, we have a core reef monitoring guide uh, for for the community and uh, other uh, um, uh, yes and uh, other manuals as you can see there and the coral bleaching alert far right. And then we also have some tools that we use for data collection. We have we make use of Google Forms and we collect our coral bleaching observation. That's the in situ data or verification data from the ground through citizen science kind of approach. And we use Google Forms. And then information that is fetched from that Google Form is used or is disseminated through the dashboard that you can see in the middle there with uh, around 854 records re 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 sent to us or respond received so far. And also we have some other uh, platforms. We have the coral bleaching alert service and also emails that we do use to disseminate our coral bleaching alert and also to receive um, uh, bleaching observation from the ground. So with this, I think um, based on the survey that was done, this will be quite some kind of uh, useful resources when it comes to responding to coral bleaching in the future. And as much as we enjoy the cool phase at the moment, so there's still some need for us to make sure that we, we are armed and some of these tools will come in quite handy. So next slide. Yeah, so I think, yeah, this is my last slide and uh, I thank you for listening. I'm hoping that we'll get a, a session for more discussion towards the end of the webinar. So thank you and back to you, Liz. Next slide, please. Great, thank you so much, James. And now we will turn to um, Dr. Marie Smith who's a senior researcher in the Coastal Systems and Earth Observation Research Group at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. Marie specializes in the field of marine remote sensing and her main areas of interest are satellite ocean color applications um, for harmful algal bloom detection, aquaculture, fisheries, and water quality decision support. So over to you, Marie. Thank you, Liz. Thank you for having me. Uh, so just a bit of background from our side. This work forms part of the Earth Observation Related Service Development that was done as part of the Marine and Coastal Operations for Southern Africa or Marco South project. Uh, next slide, please. So Marco South represents one of the four consortia under the Marine and Coastal Thematic Area within the GMS and Africa program which is aimed at increasing the uptake and utilization of Copernicus satellite data in Africa. 
So Microsoft includes eight partners from six countries around Southern and Eastern Africa, uh, with the first phase running from 2018 to 21, and the second phase starting now in 2022 and running to 2025. Next slide, please. Uh, so the Western Indian Ocean Coral Bleaching Monitoring Service was one of the six services that we designed during the first stage of the project. Uh, it was a collaborative development process between the CSR as the technical experts and Cordio East Africa as the domain experts. Next slide, please. Now, the products and services uh, provided within this service um, are based upon the products and methodology used by No Coral Reef Watch Program which have traditionally been used in Cordio's Western Indian Ocean Bleaching Alert Bulletins and are relatively familiar within the user community. And there are a couple of key differences, specifically that it was designed for the Western Indian Ocean region. As a GMS in Africa service, it uses only Copernicus Marine data products, whereas NOAA Coral Reef Watch makes use of a combination of European and NOAA satellite data. It also uses sea surface temperature climatologies uh, that are slightly different from NOAA's uh, because they are include more recent and warmer data and leads to a lower alerting level over the Western Indian Ocean. Lastly, this service includes a slightly more interactive functionality than the NOAA site with an interactive map viewer with zoomable and clickable information, date scrolling and interactive virtual stations. Uh, so you will be able to see all of these in the demonstration that's up, up next. So I will hand you back now to Liz so that she can play you the demo video of the site. Thank you, Marie. Let me share my screen. Welcome to the Western Indian Ocean Coral Bleaching Monitoring Service brought to you by GMS in Africa and Marine and Coastal Operations for Southern Africa Marco South Project in collaboration with Cordio East Africa. This service provides satellite-derived temperature-related information for countries all the way from Angola, round Southern Africa, all the way up to Kenya, with particular focus on coral bleaching monitoring activities in the Western Indian Ocean. All satellite products are derived from the Operational Sea Surface Temperature and Ice Analysis or OSTIA system produced by the UK's National Meteorological Service. These data are daily gapped filled foundation sea surface temperature fields produced from a combination of satellite data and in situ observations. Products are provided at a spatial resolution of 0.05 degrees or approximately five to six kilometers. The temporal coverage provided on this site is daily from the 1st of January 2007 up to the previous day. For instance, today is the 24th of March, and the date on the view is the 23rd of March. There are five different satellite products available on the site, in addition to a blank map. These products are produced using the methodology provided by NOAA Coral Reef Watch, but just using a regional climatology in all the calculations. Each of these satellite products can be selected by clicking on the relevant icon on the left of the screen. The active satellite data product is displayed in the product viewer in the left-hand panel. The data are overlaid on an open street maps view, and you can pan and zoom in and out as you wish using your mouse or the buttons provided on the top left. Each layer has a legend that can be displayed by clicking on the down arrow. If you cannot see the entire legend, you can adjust the box or scroll up and down on the right hand side. Below the legend, you can also see the value of any pixel by clicking on the colored areas of the map. At the top of the product viewing panel, you can scroll through the dates by using the plus or minus one day buttons, or you can select a specific date by using the date search button. You can also return to the current date by clicking on the date at the bottom of the calendar and then just subtracting one day from that. There are five different satellite products available on the service. There is the SST or the sea surface temperature 
which shows the foundation temperature of the ocean at any given point. Next is the SST anomaly, which indicates the deviation of the daily temperature at any given point from the historical average. Blue to purple areas represent negative anomalies, which are colder than average, whereas the yellow to red areas show positive anomalies and are warmer than average. The hotspots provide an indication of the instantaneous thermal stress, which can potentially lead to coral bleaching. Hotspots are calculated as the positive temperature deviations above the maximum of the monthly mean climatology. Research has shown that hotspots values above one degree Celsius can indicate thermal stress level, which could lead to coral bleaching. These areas are represented by yellow or warmer colors. The degree heating weeks product shows the accumulation of this thermal stress for a given area over a period of 12 weeks. It is calculated by integrating all hotspots above one degree Celsius over the most recent 84 days. Lastly, there is the bleaching alert areas map, which provides an indication of the current potential risk level for bleaching based on a combination of the hotspots and degree heating weeks products. In these products, the orange provides a warning for where bleaching is possible. The red represents alert level one where bleaching is likely. And the dark red represents alert level two where mortalities are likely. Another feature on the page is the virtual stations on the right top panel. You can select a station from the drop down menu, which are grouped according to country. This provides you with the SST statistics for the past week. You can change the date range for the past month, past six months, or past 12 months. And you can hover over the graph to see the exact statistics for any date at any point in the graph. You can also use the toggle to show or hide the selected virtual station position on the map. You can also view in situ bleaching observations. These points can be displayed on the active map by using the toggle on the bottom right hand panel. At this point, if nothing shows up, please just go ahead and refresh the map again. If it looks too confusing with the map background, you can also use the blank map to look at the in situ stations. For any of these points, if you hover over the information, it'll show you the date, the location, and the status of the bleaching. If you would like more information on the in-situ data point, please follow the link in the in-situ bleaching observations to the Cordio GIS tool. This will take you to an interactive website where you can see a detailed breakdown of the coral bleaching in situ observations within the past five years. Otherwise, if you would like more detailed outlook on the current state of Indian Ocean coral bleaching, please follow the link to the Cordio Bleaching Alert page. This will take you to a Cordio website where you will find the most recent coral bleaching alert as well as historical bleaching alerts. Back to you, Michelle. Great, thank you so much, Marie, for your presentation and for that video. We will um, share that link as well in the resources. Okay, and then our third and final pres uh, presenter for today is Dadley Zinganyu from the uh, Park Warden, Watami Marine Park with the Kenya Wildlife Service. Um, and has been working over 13 years in different parks and conservation areas across Kenya. His work focuses on implementation of government policies and um, on the management and protection of natural resources and collaboration with local stakeholders and communities. Over to you, Stanley. 
Thank you very much. As you have heard, I'm Dudley Ganyu, a Kenya Wildlife uh, Service Officer working in Wata Marine Protected Area. Wata Marine Protected Area is in, in the coastal part of Kenya. Next slide. So my presentation outline is about KWS, then our prediction uh, on coral bleaching, then uh, on how we monitor coral bleaching, then uh, our response to the bleaching and uh, actually the plans that we have going forward. Let's, next slide. So actually, Kenya Under Service is a, a Kenyan entity that is actually mandated to uh, manage wildlife in Kenya. And it was established in 1990 by an act of parliament. And uh, actually, we are responsible for managing Kenyan parks, reserves, and sanctuaries. And uh, our main role is actually security of wildlife and visitors who visit those particular uh, marine, uh, those protected areas. Uh, in addition to that, we are also complementing national security uh, in and outside protected areas. And we also coordinate uh, research activities within our protected areas. Next slide. So in Kenya, we have uh, eight conservation areas, and uh, one of them is coast conservation area. And that is where we have our marine projected areas dotted along the coasts. So we cover the entire coast region with the Kiunga Marine National Reserve on the north and the Kisite Mpunguti Marine National Park and Reserve on the south. In between, we have Malindi, we have Watamu, Mombasa, and Dianchale. Next slide. So uh, normally, when we have actually uh, bleaching events in Kenya, we get uh, bleaching alerts uh, from uh, Kodio, East Africa. And uh, on most occasions, again, uh, during our normal monitoring, we actually communicate between ourselves as park managers to ascertain whether there's any indication of leasing in our locations. Next slide. So, and if there's any indication of bleaching, we actually do what you call timed swims across our reefs uh, to actually estimate the severity of uh, bleaching in different sites. Uh, uh, in our protected areas, we have various sites that we monitor on a monthly basis. And uh, on normally, these are the sites that we look at when we are looking at uh, any signs of bleaching. And uh, when we actually find any sign of bleaching, uh, we actually submit the information to Code East Africa for analysis. Next slide. So our response to bleaching actually is, uh, as you know, bleaching is a natural phenomenon and uh, actually there's very little that we can do to it. But on most occasions what you do is we actually monitor the bleaching events on most occasions depending on the severity of the event. So if the bleaching is very severe, we do actually uh, monitoring twice a week. And if it is not very severe, we do monitoring once a week. And the kind of information that we get there is actually shared among our stakeholders. And there are measures that we put in place to ensure that uh, actually uh, we try as much as possible to improve the water quality to see whether this particular mini uh, uh, corals can actually uh, recover from the bleaching event. So on most occasions, what we do, we actually consult with the researchers and experts to actually see how best we can actually uh, monitor the situation and uh, uh, the actions we can take into 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 into, into consideration. But uh, most importantly, uh, what we do on most occasions is to ensure 
that uh, the fisheries management in the protected areas is actually top notch and we do this by actually surveilling the area to uh, ensure that fishermen in our reserves actually do what is required so fishing activities and in no tech zones we ensure that there is no fishing that is taking place we also create awareness to our fishermen through the beach management units uh, on legal methods of fishing just to ensure that there is no overfishing and again just to ensure that the quality of the water is actually improved we do what we call um, beach cleanups and even underwater cleanups to get rid of any polluters especially the plastics from our marine protected areas and uh, we also go to the hotels to ensure that uh, they don't actually uh, do any pollution within our pro, uh, within our protected areas by maybe discharging uh, harmful water or uh, dirty water into the the, the 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 marine protected areas next so those are just some of the pictures of uh, our staff undertaking monitoring and the beach cleanups uh, in our marine protected areas and uh, before we even do for those particular uh, we go for those particular activities we always have briefings uh, between our staff so that um, and even our stakeholders sometimes our stakeholders join us during our briefings just to ensure that uh, whatever is being done and whatever we are trying to monitor is understood and uh, everybody takes it as a responsibility to ensure that uh, the MPA or the marine protected area is secured. Next slide. So our plans going forward is actually to improve the way we do our monitoring. We are in discussion with Cordio East Africa to actually develop a bleaching response plan and uh, by doing so we shall actually lay uh, more transits within our, our protected areas and uh, do more uh, monitoring in those particular uh, areas that will shall lay transits just to come up with the actually informed decisions uh, even as we talk now we may not know the corals that are actually more resilient to bleaching so our plan is actually to do serious monitoring to see which corals are actually are resilient and uh, to see how the reef in general is actually responding to bleaching events next slide I think we may have lost you, Dadley, um, but I think we were on just the uh, the thank you slide. So maybe um, as good a time as any, if, if we were gonna lose you, maybe on the thank you slide. So hopefully we get you back on. Dadley, let us know. Oh, I can hear you. You're breaking up. Hmm. Okay, so uh, yeah, sounds like we are. That is what I can do. Are you there? Okay, great. Well, we are going to move on to the question and answer session. Thank you so much, Dadley, for that presentation. Thank you as well to James and Marie. All of those presentations were let me turn my video on. Um, were really interesting um and and i hope everyone learned a lot so now on to the q a um again there are two ways you can ask questions so please feel free at this time you can either ask your question in the question box we have a couple that have come in during the webinar so i'll ask those first um but i will also be watching for hands raised as well please feel free um to raise your hand and ask your question aloud um, <clears throat> that's a great way to do it during these live webinars. 
Okay, so I'll start with some of the questions that have come in. Can we have all of the presenters um, put their videos back on uh, if possible? Thanks, James. Yeah, Dadley, Marie, just waiting for you. All right, great, we have everyone. Um, so we had a couple questions come in um, for you, Marie, about the, um, the mapping tool. Um, the first was um, asking if you could explain more about the historical averages shown for that bleaching tool. How are they, um, what is the historical average of, or um, can you explain just a little bit more about how that's calculated and shown? Sure. So um, the historical averages or climatologies that is used, uh, for instance, and in, so this is based on NOAA's uh, methodology. Uh, so they they use a uh, historical climatology that's based. I th uh, uh, unfortunately, I can't remember the exact dates. I think it's from about 80, 1985 up to twenty thirteen, possibly, but I can't remember the exact dates. Um, and uh, the guy, the guys at Cordia had just found that. Um, because it's because there's been a, a slight warming trend it's just come down to the fact that um because the waters are a bit warmer now than they were uh there seems to be a bit of an overestimation of the uh, bleaching alerts um whereas i think possibly hopefully the coral guys can correct me if i'm wrong some of the corals have seemed to kind of adapt slightly so the very severe bleaching stress that's indicated isn't necessarily as severe as as it is indicated in the products um, but yeah so we just use um, a slightly different period to calculate the climatology so this is just like the monthly average sea surface temperature over a couple of years um, uh, and it's and the monthly me, ma maximum um, over a certain over a certain amount of years, so it's just that that period for the climatologies is just slightly different to what NOAA uses, but the everything else is exactly the same. Sorry, that was a bit longer than I was <laughs> anticipating. No, that was great. Um, it, so someone mentioned it looks like there are hot spots and degree heating weeks where in the map where there are no um, corals. Is that correct? Yes, um, it's just a blanket. Um, we're just using the same product for everywhere, so it doesn't matter if there's corals. It's just it's just going based on the sea surface temperature map. Yeah, and maybe if I can just jump into or clarify on that, that's why expert knowledge again is quite necessary. And so once you get the products and you can get the information, then based on the your knowledge on where the reef locations are and the season that you're in. Then we use that information to do to, to give the or the bleaching warning or alert. Great, thank you. Um, and then I think this is the final question about the tool. Um, can the climatology and MMM information be downloaded as well? I guess can can information be downloaded from that tool? Um, I think it's only. It's currently only got functionality to download the um, the like a, a JPEG or a PNG version of the image, um, but I think anybody is free to contact us, uh, and we can try and grab like an HCDF of a, of a file, uh, or at least the climatologies if they're interested. Great, thanks. Uh, we had one um, participant ask. A this is maybe a, a, I'm not sure who to direct this question to, um, so feel free to jump in. Um, they wanted to know whether um, damage estimates from coral bleaching are often included in like loss and damage claims at the international level. At international climate talks are, you know, is the, the damage caused by bleaching events often um, brought up during those discussions. Does anyone here in this panel have any insight on that question? 
Um, not directly, but I, what I know, looking for instance at the Corum, the GCRMN report of the 2020, I think some of these uh, activities or reports are, are being picked up at the international level, and they are used to make maybe to, to justify some of the events or some circumstances that we are finding ourselves in, but there has not been any direct uh, kind of uptake that, that I know or claims that I know. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> One question was, why is it important to monitor during these cooler times? Maybe this is for you, James. Mm -hmm. um, should we still send reports of no bleaching? Is that important to do even during these cooler years or cooler months? Yeah, so it's quite important. Actually, now we might be feeling like we, we are out of the woods, but yeah, this school affairs people might relax, but we always encourage our our stakeholders to even send us a bleaching observation, even where bleaching has not been observed. So that information is is as equally as important as any other uh, information on uh, bleaching observation. First, it is useful in that, for instance, if you are looking at the verification of the satellite products. So this becomes quite useful in terms of uh, ground truthing and uh, validating our uh, satellite other observation the data. So it is useful for us to, in short, to, to monitor even when there is, the situation seems to be cool. And so that also in future, you are able to, to do a, a comparative analysis kind of to see how things have changed over the years. Right, and it looks like we have a participant with their hand up, a Lem Elma. Let me um, unmute you so you can ask your question. I think you need to unmute yourself as well. Oh, put your hand down. Uh, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think I've just put it into the question panel. Um, but yeah, it's just, I, I don't know if I missed it. But is there any chance to actually have access to any coral bleaching data for certain locations within that interactive map? If you just, um, yeah, want to compare regions or um, compare to your own data and see what's actually going on, um, sort of looking into the metadata behind the bleaching uh, and the visualization that you can see, or would you need to contact? I don't know, someone specifically. Oh, is that in um, there? I'm can, not sure. Can I just ask, are you referring to the in-situ bleaching data shown in the GIS yes. tool? Or are you, okay, I think that would be James's yeah. department. <laughs> Yeah, so I was also not sure whether she's uh, well, they're asking you for the uh, other observation data, the satellite data of the in situ points. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it is actually possible to get this uh, uh, coral bleaching observation data, the, the in situ data. You can just drop us an email and then we can just forward uh, arrange that to you. We also, uh, I can also link you with our team. Uh, at Cordio. So if you are so much interested in the global regional analysis or on, on coral bleaching or the status of the reefs of the wheel for comparison purposes. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Very helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Okay. Um, this is a question for you, Dadley. Um, the question is about how you share this monitoring information that you have. You mentioned you shared it with local stakeholder groups. Have you found that there are more effective ways to do this um, with them? Or are there key pieces of information that you need to share with local communities and stakeholders? I don't know if we can hear you, Dadley. Um, there you go. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, on most occasions, uh, the data that we collect um, 
there's an online form that is sent to us uh, by Cordio uh, every two weeks. And uh, that is the, the, the form that we fill. It's an online form. That is the form that we fill and we actually share with Cordio East Africa. Then uh, again, some of the data that we actually uh, <clears throat> get from the, the new, from the MPM, we actually display uh, in our information center uh, within our uh, marine protected area for any stakeholder to see. Uh, and this one is actually accompanied by even photos of uh, actually what is happening within uh, our, our protected area. So that is how we share our data and information. Yeah. Okay. And then similar, similarly so, jumping on that, um, are there ways that you communicate this information with other managers in Kenya? Are you talking to other managers in different marine parks or working with them? Yeah, we have a, 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 a local network of marine managers and we meet on a uh, on regular basis to discuss uh, our monitoring programs within our marine protected areas. Um. Great, thank you. All right, we had a question about, this is also about the tool. Um, um, is it possible to distinguish the, well, maybe not, maybe this is um, for all of you guys. Is it possible to distinguish different impacts from different stressors, um, including temperature, ocean acidification, or other influences like nutrient pollution? I'm not sure if the question is in regards to what's available on the mapping tool or maybe in the water. So maybe this is more for, for Dadley, but, but you know, how you can, assess the different impacts of of um maybe new you know water quality as you mentioned Adley, versus um bleaching and and whether those um water quality or, or no take or um fisheries regulations are are improving the condition of the reefs during bleaching events It seems like it's, that is directed to me. <laughs> okay. Thank you, James. Yeah, maybe just uh, ideally, it's uh, a bit more... Uh, per se, if I can say that the coral bleaching itself, it's a, it's a phenomenon and it can be caused by either um, increase in sea surface temperature of a particular period, but and the, so the SST is the main culprit uh, that's temperature is the main culprit, but looking as also ocean acidification and pollution, they also lead to to bleaching. And bleaching itself is kind of um, uh, a disruption in the symbiotic relationship between corals and the algae that lives within them. So anything that is causing stress to the corals, be it pollution, I think bleaching will happen. At some point, I think it is quite uh, conspicuous, you can tell what is causing that. And some other points, I think it could be quite difficult to differentiate, especially where the, there is an interplay of all the, 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 the stressors. We have temperatures, we have uh, things to do with the pollution and acidification and all that. So yeah, unless you dig a bit more deeper, <laughs> it might not be quite obvious for you to to pinpoint exactly what is happening at that particular point. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question that came in. Does any panel member um, or their organization collect additional information from practitioners, um, perhaps related to other parameters like sedimentation or salinity um, or is there work comparing how each site over the years has handled um, these bleaching events um, differently? I, you know, there's some talk about monitoring for reef resilience. Often resilience assessments will compare sites against each other. So um, um, do any of your organizations, you know, look at how different sites have fared against bleaching and how have 
is this information available anywhere? Yeah, so again, I'll still come in because at Cordia, again, we we are synonymous in all with coral reef uh, work. And yeah, so there are various studies, several studies that have been done comparing sites. And I think there is a report that was, actually it is a paper that was published in 2016 after the mass bleaching event of 2016. And yeah, it is possible to get this kind of information even from the GIS tool that we, we are talking about that you will share at some point through the link. It is possible actually to, to have a, a synoptic view of a, of a particular site. But in case they, they need more, more details, information, we have more than, I think we've been doing coronary monitoring over the last two, two decades, uh, more than 20 years. So we have the data, the resources and the personnel to actually respond to that and link you to, to any other available resource or information. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, one question was about um, uh, this increase in local fishery surveillance and enforcement. How long, um, I think this is for you, Dadley, how long do you guys um, do this extra surveillance and enforcement in fisheries um, during or after a bleaching event? I think you're muted, Dali. Sorry, let me make sure you're unmuted. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Normally, actually, surveillance is our daily activity. It's part of our daily activities within the marine protected area. Uh, but when we see uh, bleaching events occurring, I think we try as much as possible to intensify our patrols and even uh, gain uh, education and awareness among our fishing communities so that uh, we, we teach them on which target species to actually uh, look for and which ones to avoid, especially the, 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 the herbivores. Uh, as you know, they are very important when it comes to cleaning corals. Uh, sometimes we, we, we will try as much as possible to ensure that um, the fishermen know uh, the kind of species of fish to get from the uh, the reserves, and again to know that uh, the the park is a no tech zone, and this one actually assists uh, in actually ensuring that uh, the uh, the key species of fish are retained in the MBM. Great, thank you. Those are all. All the questions that I have in the question box. Are there any other questions from our attendees? Does anyone want to raise their hand or submit any final questions? Maybe I'll give you a minute to do that. It doesn't look like I have anything coming in. So that might be might be the final question. Okay, so in that case, we will move on to closing up. Before we end the webinar, um, we wanted to take just a few minutes um, to cover and go over some of the other bleaching prediction tools that are out there. Um, and other bleaching relevant resources. Um, the most well-known bleaching tool, uh, I think of course, at least on this side, is the NOAA Coral Reef Watch products that were uh, mentioned a couple of times during this webinar and used in, in various other products. Um, um, we wanted to mention here that NOAA offers a host of bleaching prediction and alert tools on their website that are free and open access. They're now to the five kilometer resolution level. And they have a, a variety of maps that are available um, for every reef region in the world. Some of their maps um, are bleaching alerts, hot spots, degree heating weeks, sea surface temperature um, anomalies, heat anomalies, and then also trends over time. 
Um, they also offer a tutorial on their website on how to use these five kilometer products. Um, so feel free to, to look at that if you're just going to the website for the first time. Um, I just want to mention all of these resources that I'm mentioning right now will be shared in our email announcement after the webinar, and they will also be posted on our website as well in our page where we will um, host this webinar recording. Next slide. There you go. Another um, new and important tool that was also mentioned um, is the Allen Coral Atlas. This offers a global coral reef um, habitat map um, with a variety of layers that can be used. And one of the newer layers um, includes satellite data that looks at the brightness of coral reefs um, over a certain number of weeks to predict reef bleaching across the globe. It does this in three different categories, severe bleaching, moderate bleaching, and low bleaching. Um, in this slide, you can see where I've circled the uh, Coral Reef Watch tool. I think that's that is the location where you can toggle on and off to see this bleaching layer. Um, this is still um, a, a newer layer for this this product, and in general, the Allen Coral Atlas is a, is a newer tool as well. Um, but the developers are looking for users to help them test and validate these bleaching predictions. Um, the Allen Coral Atlas team was gracious enough to put together a five minute video that goes over this tool more in depth and how you can use it and also help them validate it. Um, so we will share the link to this video in our email and also on our website, on our website so you can learn more about this tool, about the new bleaching layer and how you can use it and help validate it on the ground. Next slide. And then finally, there are a range of other bleaching resources out there. Um, outside of prediction tools. Um, I've included this slide here um, with just a couple of these, um, some from Cordio East Africa and some from the Reef Resilience Network. Again, we will post all of these on our website and in the announcement, but it includes um, some of the, some links to some of the um, resources that James shared, their coral bleaching monitoring guide. They have several bleaching guides and trainings available on their website, how to respond to bleaching. And then um, James also um, showed this manual for community-based coral reef monitoring. All of that is open access. The Reef Resilience Network also has a toolkit on coral bleaching, including uh, bleaching response plans and how to develop those. Um, we also have a case study database that includes numerous case studies on um, coral bleaching response from uh, managers from different locations around the world. So be sure to check those out. And next slide. I think that maybe that's the last slide. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, I just want to say another uh, big thank you again to today's speakers. Thank everyone as well. Um, thank you all for uh, the attendees who joined us and asked really great questions and participated in this webinar. Um, please feel free to carry on the discussion on the Reef Resilience Network forum. This is a free online community for managers, practitioners, and scientists where you can connect and, and learn from each other and uh, meet new people and ask them what they're doing and how they do their work. Um, if you're interested in getting more information um, and uh, more resources from the Reef Resilience Network, please also see the link at the bottom of the slide to sign up for our quarterly newsletter. This is the really the best way to get um, information from us about new resources that we've developed. We hope everyone um, has a really nice day or night, afternoon, um, wherever you are in the world. Thank you again for joining us today and we hope to see you on another webinar soon. Thank you.